I am Peter Lindbergh, the steward of the STOA. And today is part of a series, uh, a sense maker in residence series at the STOA. Um, it's what we have here. We have someone who's trying to make sense of the world, uh, visit the STOA for four sessions over four weeks, uh, the same day, the same time uh, each week to share their thoughts on a certain theme. Uh, and the idea is to build a discussion throughout the month. Uh, and we had John Robb, a military analyst, uh, just end his sense maker in residence for August. And we, upcoming ones, we have Peter Wang, Zach Stein, Benita Roy, Daniel Schmachtenberger, Nor Bateson, many more. And today uh, we have the one and only, everyone's favorite sense-making bad boy from Wales, Dave Snowden, uh, here today. And in a moment, we will uh, formally give a more robust introduction of, of Dave. Uh, but the, with the, how this series is gonna work, we're gonna have a facilitator MC for each series. So I'll introduce the series and then the MC will take over from here. And today we have Khalil Martin. Uh, Cleo Martin's an engineer and data scientist in Toronto, Canada, and he's facilitated many sessions at the STOA, uh, such as the Metagame Mastermind and the Dark STOA. So I'll hand it over to Cleo. Cleo will introduce David and, and, tell, and say how this uh, today's session is going to work. So that being said, Cleo, I will take you in. Thanks, Peter. Um, how's my audio? Everything okay? It's good. Great. I uh, just want to welcome back Dave. Um, he was here in April, is that right, Dave? Um, for you, I'm, I'm sure most of you guys uh, were here. Um, let me know who's here, who wasn't. But yeah, you guys should definitely check that out. It's up, up on YouTube. Uh, for those who don't know Dave Snowden, he is a pioneering uh, management consultant and researcher in the topics of sense making and anthro complexity more broadly. Um, he's a very industrious man with an interesting past. Um, and I hope we can learn more about that past um, in, the, in the following sessions. Um, his work moves up and down the social stack from ethnography to global policy. And I would say that he has one of the most compelling voices in the paths between humanities and hard sciences in the true, um, in the true spirit of complexity science. And I, and I think that's what we're gonna talk about uh, today. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Dave. Uh, well, maybe I can uh, start off with a question for you, unless you have something prepared right off the bat, Dave. No? Okay. Go for it. Okay, so I guess how, how, what would you describe your role in civilization as? What, what is your vocation? What do you, what do you call yourself? Uh, that's a difficult one. Um, I think what I'm trying to do um, overall is to bring a science-based approach to sense making all right and there are various reasons I think that's important but I mean let me just summarize I don't think we ever lived in a fact-based society I think the idea of we're in a post-fact society is actually nonsense yeah, yeah we never lived in a fact-based society people normally delegate decision making but really from the 1940s onwards, we kind of like just assumed that the experts knew what they were doing. And that really hasn't panned out for a lot of people. So we're trying demagogues instead at the moment, all right? And that's gonna get really nasty. So from my point of view, I think there's a sort of rationality in the way we make decisions at an individual level, a company level, a society level, which we desperately need to find a, a new way of working for. Yeah? And from my point of view, I think the, the discovery of complexity science, which happened more or less within my lifetime. Yeah. Um, and it is, I'm rumbling around a bit at the moment, but Alicia Girard and I once sat down, Alicia, if you haven't read Girard's stuff on, on complexity, she's one of the, the authors and one of the best people I know. And we're both philosophers by background. Although I didn't do a doctorate under Searle, which she did, so that's definitely one up, right? Um, we said one of the great things about complexity science is it allows multiple, multiple incompatible ontological states to coexist. And that actually resolves a hell of a lot of problems in philosophy. So Alicia um, famously in a book, Dynamics in Action, resolves the old dilemma of when is a wink a blink? And I spent a term of my life at university writing essays about that. 
And it's kind of like an important distinction. If you don't get it right in a bar late at night, you might get your face slapped, right? So, and it, it's a problem of intentionality. Yeah? So intentionality, free will, once you start to realize there are systems which have inherent uncertainty and critically don't have material linear causality, you start to get a very different basis on which you make decisions. And my definition of sense making is how do we make sense of the world so that we can act in it? Yeah. Um, overall, it's now recognized as one of five schools of sense making. Um, I mean, the great granddaddy of all of this is Carl Weick. Um, Weick really comes out of the sort of US sociological tradition. It's all about retrospective coherence. It's observational derivation of theory. And I'll come back to why I didn't take that approach. Yeah? Um, you've got Dervin, who comes from library science. I have a huge amount of respect for Brenda. And some of the time I've spent with her has been, you know, some of the treasured times of my life, uh, both in Frisco and at her home. She's really coming from an information science postmodernist background yeah, in, in terms of the way she thinks. And you've got Gary Klein, who I can also count as a friend. In fact, I used a lot of work from Gary Klein, um, who is kind of like into the whole mental models thing. He was the guy who discovered experimentally how people make decisions, uh, which is a key part of my work, yeah, through observation of firefighters and aircraft guys. So he was the gun guy who discovered experimentally the pattern basis of human decision making. So we scan, and, and I can now go into the harder science on this. Gary did it observationally. I did it by talking with a whole bunch of cognitive neuroscientists. We scan about 5% of the data that's available to us on a good day if we're really focused. Um, normally it's a lot less than that. Um, if you're Chinese, the figure doubles. Um, typically, really focused, somebody from a Chinese background will actually scan about 10%. Um, we think the evolutionary difference for that is the difference between symbolic and literal languages. So in, if you're speaking Mandarin, you have to understand the context of every symbol to know what it means. So if you look at some of the other experiments on this, Chinese students shown a picture of a tiger drinking from a stream in the forest will remember the forest and will often miss the tiger. American students will nearly always see the tiger and miss the forest. It's like a context object difference, yeah? Um, so if we take the epigenetic effect of language, we know that's sort of been built into biology, right? So we can see that difference. But, you know, for all human beings, whatever background, we're scanning a fragment of what's available to us. And we then do a first fit pattern match with previous experience. Uh, not a best fit, a first fit. All right, and this is called, this is combo stuff, this is called conceptual blending. What we do is we take a partial stimulus and then we blend it together with various memories, yeah, and extended memories and group memories, which are triggered by that observation. And we blend together those memories and decide what to do. Uh, and that's how all human beings make decisions unless they're fully autistic at which point they scan everything and they can't cope. That literally can't cope, yeah, um, because of the, the volume overload. Now, you can see why this happens in evolutionary terms. If you think about the early hominoids on the savannas of Africa, or possibly the, South, the Mediterranean Sea, that's starting to get disputed at the moment. Um, something large and yellow with very sharp teeth runs towards you at high speed. Uh, do you want to autistically scan all available data, look up a catalogue of the flora and fauna of the African veldt, and having an identified lion, look at best practice case studies on how to deal with lions? Yeah. Uh, by that time, the only document of any use to you will be the book of Jonah from the Old Testament, which is the only written example I've found of how to escape from the digestive tract of a large carnivore, yet written by a purported survivor. Yeah. So we evolved to make decisions very, very quickly based on a partial data scan, privilege in our most recent experiences. Yeah. Now, if that's the way we make decisions, what patterns we use are then critical. 
And what I'm going to probably do on the third one of these is talk about the work we're doing with distributed ethnography, um, effectively to present multiple patterns, right? So that we can actually pre-filter the data uh, by presenting things from different perspectives. Right? Um, I mean, the other famous experiment on this, which I referenced in the April talk, is the, the radiologists given a batch of x-rays, asked to scan for anomalies. And on the final x-ray, a picture of a gorilla is placed in plain sight, which is 48 times the size of a cancer nodule. And on average, 83% of radiologists don't see it, even though their eyes physically scan it. Uh, they, they do not see what they're not expecting to see. Now, most of the time, this makes perfect sense. It's very rarely that people have miniature gorillas in their lungs and therefore it's unlikely to occur anyway, right? So we need to realize, and this is another coming back to Klein, Klein argues very strongly, we shouldn't talk about cognitive biases, I agree with him. We should talk about cognitive heuristics. Uh, evolution doesn't throw out things which don't have utility. Yeah, so if you look at all the so-called cognitive biases, they're all about reducing the energy cost of making decisions. And on average, they kind of like pan out better. And reduction of energy cost is critical in evolution, and particularly for humans, because our brain takes up so much energy, disproportionate in many ways to its utility, that we have a problem. So Klein's, Klein discovered that in terms of the way that people did mental rehearsal. And this contradicts some of Weick's work, because Klein and Weick both work with what are called crews i.e. Uh, people in mission critical environments. And my own work basically argues that the ritualization of becoming a crew member creates a cognitive trigger, which actually defines the way in which you scan data. Um, the original project we did on that was way back in New Zealand, um, where we were looking at um, safety in lorry drivers, sorry, truck drivers for the Americans amongst you. Um, and we did that. This was distributed ethnography. So we put students into the cabs um, for three weeks, gathering narrative on a continuous basis. And I'll talk more about this in, in the third session yeah, and how we do that. Key thing is this is a quantitative approach, not a qualitative approach. Yeah, my, my background is in physics. I don't buy qual. Yeah, it, it's, you know, quant matters, right? And no social scientist ever has enough data to form any valid conclusion whatsoever. So kind of like we're looking at increasing the volume of data. Yeah. So if I've got students acting as ethnographers in direct observation of cab drivers, I can get a lot of data very quickly. Um, and the principle was simple. The lorry driver could ask, just assume truck driver if you don't get it. I need to go back to vernacular at this time of night. Right? So the, the lorry driver you know, could ask the student to do anything which was legal. We thought we put that qualification in. Right? Um, and in return for which kind of like, you know, that helped. That built a relationship. So they started to earn things up. And that was a fascinating project. One is we found that amphetamine use was about three times what people thought. And it turned out the main modulating factor behind, and I'm going to use modulator rather than cause generally, the main modulating factor behind amphetamine use was actually the tachograph. So it was the device designed to control how, you know, how many hours people drive, which was meant to make them safer, um, was actually producing crazy behavior because if they hit within a certain margin, they just had to stop and sleep in the cab. You know, when they could have gone on for like 10 minutes and stayed somewhere comfortable, but they couldn't do that because of the physical record. Yeah. Um, so that was interesting, but we also, and it parallels work we've done on safety in the northeast of England, which shows the main reason for mental breakdown is the health and safety regulation, not the job. And that's working with what we call blue light services. Yeah, because basically any formal system, and I'm now coming to the complexity thing, any formal system assumes you're in the center of a normal distribution. Uh, whereas a substantial amount of life happens in the tails of a Pareto distribution. Um, so if you look at hospital safety procedures, they're based on single morbidity. 
that most entries into hospital are multimorbidity and that that changes effectively the distribution pattern of risk. Yeah. Um, so we found that, but then we also found that somewhere in the region of 80% um, of the accidents, the off-road accidents, were actually happening in the first 10 to 15 minutes after a lorry arrived at the harbour and the driver started to unload the lorry. Now, nobody had tracked it at that level of data before, but that was significant. And we speculated and later proved that the reason was very simple. They've been driving for 100, 200 miles. Yeah, so the cognitive activation patterns, the patterns through which they were scanning or filtering available data were effectively driver patterns. And it was taking the brain 10 to 15 minutes to reset itself as a loader. And therefore they were having the classic sort of weightlifting type accidents. And the intervention we did there, which cut accidents by two thirds, was we got them all to strap on a heated weightlifter's belt before they unpacked the lorry. So we created a ritual to switch them from being driver to loader. And it was a physical ritual as well, that strapping on changed their stance. And we associated the training with strapping on the belt. So there was only one rule, you don't unload till you strap on the belt. Yeah, and because it had heated gel pads, everybody wanted to strap it on anyway, because it was a really nice feeling when you did it. And that made a significant difference. Yeah. Now, that to me is quite important because Klein's work identified that as well. Vike tends to work, tends to generalize from the particular, and this is a key complexity principle. Complexity recognizes that most things are context specific Whereas the dominant approach in management science until complexity, long, complexity came along was to assume context free. So this is where I'm going to maybe or maybe not get controversial, but I really don't apologize if I upset anybody with this. I'm happy to defend it. All right? um, what you actually see is people go in, you know, and, and Vike did this a lot. So if you look at Vike and Sutcliffe on, um, I've forgotten the name of the book, it's got a yellow cover. It's on mission critical systems anyway, right? And I, I think Vike is a lot better when he writes on his own. I think when he's writing with Sutcliffe, the quality goes down a lot, but that's just a personal opinion. Um, but basically what he does, he studies people like aircraft carriers, um, firefighters, um, with the intent of discovering what their characteristics are, which cause them to share failure. Now, anybody with any background in knowledge management knows that sharing failure is the most critical thing. And it's the most difficult thing because there's more learning in failure than there is in success. But the consequences of failure of hive, so people won't do it. So Vike discovered a group of people, yeah, I say US Navy personnel on carriers, firefighters, um, who actually did share failures. So he went and studied them, identified things they had in common, and that was what was written up as things you should do. Now, I remember the first time I read that book, and unfortunately I was at a conference with its authors, so I probably shouldn't have said what I said. Um, and I remember saying that and said, but you've, you've selected crews. Yeah, you, you've selected environments in which people wear uniform where they're highly ritualized. Yeah, and I said, I can replicate the behavior of firefighters if I burn the office down every morning, but that's probably not an acceptable management practice. Yeah, and just say that didn't go down very well, right? Um, but I stand by it, right? So this context of context, free context, specific one is a key one. Um, and understanding of context is critical to actually any type of sense making. Right, and you've got, I mean, this is generally part of the problem. We've got the confusion of correlation with causation, which is a real problem in social science. And the way I normally illustrate that is if Wales, which is the country I come from, we have 3 million people. If we want to increase the number of Nobel prizes we win per head of population, then all we actually have to do is increase dark chocolate consumption. Because if you didn't know it, dark chocolate consumption directly correlates with Nobel Prizes per head of population over the last 30 years worldwide. And that's a much bigger sample than most social scientists ever work with. 
And so it's kind of like a simple thing and it's quite pleasurable. I quite like dark chocolate. So, you know, we, we, we start that process, all right? So that confusion is, is a real problem. Um, so what I started to do, and this was originally when I was in IBM research, um, was to focus instead on using natural science as a constraint. You know, I'll, I'll talk more about constraints um, next time around when I talk about Kinevin, right? Because in complexity, mapping constraints is probably the most important thing you do. Um, because constraints are ordered aspects in general of a complex system and they can be managed and changed. So one of the ways you actually manage a complex system is to change the constraints. Um, so what I decided to do was to accept natural science as a constraint. Uh, this matches in with constructor theory in physics, which is Dukas and others at Cambridge, where they're trying to look at physics from a whole systems point of view rather than an atomistic point of view. And the example I always give is the moon and the satellite are both subject to the laws of gravity that act as a constraint. But the energy cost of putting up a satellite is a lot less than the energy cost of putting up the moon. Therefore, that's more likely to happen. So what that translates into is what does natural science tell us about the nature of systems, the nature of interactions, the nature of human cognition? Yeah? And that is a constraint. We know that that gives us security. Things will operate within that constraint or without that constraint, because constraints can be internal or external. Yeah, endo against exoskeleton. Yeah. So basically, within those constraints, yeah, we've got a degree of predictability, and then we can apply methods consistent with those constraints and then develop them in practice. Uh, the old name for that is praxis, yeah, the interaction of theory with practice. Yeah. Or as Aristotle put it, the interaction of Sophia and Pranesis. Yeah, practical wisdom with theoretical wisdom, and you kind of like need both. Yeah. So that was the general approach we adopted initially within IBM and then subsequently when I left IBM, um, which was about 16 years ago now, um, in terms of setting up Cognitive Edge and then the Kinevin Center. Um, so that allows you to do better decision making under conditions of uncertainty. So the other point is if you live in uncertain times, and one of the things I'm going to talk about on the final session on this is the work I'm doing for the European Union at the moment, because I'm writing their handbook on crisis management yeah, using Kinevin. Yeah, and if there's, you know, we live in very uncertain times. What happened in the past is not going to give me predictive power for what will happen in the future. Yeah, um, one of my favorite phrases is, is hindsight is very valuable, but hindsight doesn't lead to foresight. Okay. But I do know that I can't change the way that people make decisions. So I can't make people be rational at an individual level. I can't get rid of inattentional blindness. Yeah, you will see what you expect to see. And interestingly, if you're part of the 17% who do see the gorilla, you come to believe you were wrong when you talk with the 83% who didn't. So if that's a scientific constraint, then I need to build systems which make the 17% visible before they talk to the 83% and make that available to senior decision makers. Right. So you, you see where I'm going with this, right? Um, I've got something which I know which is true, so I can build methods and tools associated with that. Yeah. The other thing which comes in here is a link between three bodies of theory. Um, one is Deleuzian epistemology and the concept of an assemblage. And that is becoming more and more important as a theoretical construct in the health sector at the moment. Yeah. Uh, in complexity, something which is called a strange attractor, which most people know as the Lorenz butterfly. So there's a nothing ever follows the same pathway, but there is a pattern which you can recognize. Yeah. And in narrative theory, what's called a trope. Yeah. I, I really don't like the concept of memes. Um, partly because I think Dawkins is an idiot. 
right? Um, and I yet to find a single geneticist who takes him remotely seriously. Um, I mean, the idea that the gene is seeking to replicate itself is a form of anthropomorphization, which is quite dangerous. Um, and if anybody hasn't re written, read Mary Midgley's book, Science and Poetry, um, she's one of the great British philosophers. She's one of those group of female philosophers who were at Oxford during the war when there weren't any males around. Uh, there's a whole group of them, yeah. Anscombe, Midgley and others. Um, Dawkins actually changed the introduction to selfish gene to try and combat her attack on him. Um, because she basically said he was trying to create a biological justification for Thatcher and Reagan. And he got quite upset by that. Yeah. Um, the reality is, and, and the mean metaphor comes across, which is actually quite dangerous, right? There isn't a single story or narrative seeking to replicate itself. Um, what we see in human decision makers is a whole body of anecdotes. So I tell a story, you tell a story, I like your story, so I tell similar stories. Yeah, and on the internet that happens much faster. Yeah, and then those stories form what in English is called a trope. Yeah, and it reaches a critical mass and it goes through a phase shift. And then the trope or the assemblage or the strange attractor exists independently of the storyteller. Yeah, and people effectively get sucked into it. Yeah, they can't escape from it. And then they start to filter data because the assemblage is a cognitive activation pattern. And this is the problem. I keep trying to explain this. I mean, for my many and various sins, I have to read Trump's tweets every morning. Um, and what Trump is doing is to just catalyze tropes. He's not making a rational argument. He's using key phrases to effectively to catalyze the trope. And every time a Boston Brahmin or a well-meaning liberal argues against him logically, they make the trope more, they make the trope worse because all of the things that they say, the trope has, has already evolved to deal with those as a conspiracy theory or as that's what they say or they don't care and so on and so forth. Yeah. Now that was driven home to me. Um, I don't think I told this story last time, but it bears retelling anyway. So I was in, during the last presidential election, I was in California. Um, having dinner with Kent Beck and got invited to a champagne or cyanide party, uh, which fortunately I didn't go to because I've had to drink the cyanide, I think. Um, and the next day I flew over to DC and got pulled into a crisis level meeting. Um, I've done a lot of work with the intelligence community over the years. In fact, all of this stuff started when I was working with John Poindexter. Um, in DARPA. So I know a lot of those guys. So I was a foreigner. I was, you know, expert. I got pulled in. I've never seen the CIA, the FBI and the State Department all work together before in my life, but they were all together now. You know, this was kind of like, you know, the sort of deep state in action. And I think halfway through, it's kind of like, what the hell do we do? I said, well, you guys just didn't make the case. And they said, you don't understand how bad it is. So three of us got put into a helicopter and flown west. I still don't know to this day where we went. Yeah, and we were put in a lot, given a hired car, told to drive 50 miles north and go into a designated bar. Um, our cover story was we were European tourists. And we were told to go into the bar and argue against Trump. And I remember they said to me, you know, don't worry about it. You're quite safe. We're going to have armed officers in the bar. And I wasn't worried about it till they said that. Um, so either way, we go through this, all right? We go into the bar. I've drawn the short straw. Um, there's an American football match, yeah, on the television. So I decide I'm going to go down the sports route, yeah? Um, I'm Welsh, all right, we play a real sport called rugby, you know, it kind of like goes on for long periods of time and offence has to become defence and you don't wear lots of padding. So I'm now playing the sort of male game here of that's not a real sport, look at all the padding, yeah? And, well, you know, you, you know what's going on, right? In the course of that, I established that I teach at West Point, which I do. You know, I teach just war theory at West Point every now and then. So that gave me credibility, right? 
and it's all going really well. Drinks have been bought, you know, it's classic male sort of bonding type stuff. And then I started to use a Socratic technique and the delight of philosophy is you're trained in Socratic questioning. Um, but you tend to forget what happened to Socrates when the people of Athens got fed up with it. All right. So I start the Socratic technique and after he, I've got him to contradict himself three times. Yeah, this was their leader. He walked away from the bar and everything's gone quiet now. Yeah. And he turned around, he put both hands up with two fingers and he said, fuck you, you bastard. That's your education talking. Yeah, and I've never forgotten that. That's your education talking. Yeah? And I remember we then went back to DC and I said, okay, guys, I get it now. Yeah, this is a fundamental, it, it's, a, it's a fundamental trope that people are not going to escape from. Yeah? Now, some of the things I'll talk about in the future session, this is kind of like a general introduction to the field, uh, something in complexity, which is called the adjacent possible. So if you want to disrupt a deeply negative attractor, then you find an adjacent attractor which is weaker and you make it stronger. Right? Because then things will move across. This is called vector theory of change. Yeah. So you don't say where you want to be, you say we could go there next. In fact, one of the key lessons of complexity um, is that we start journeys with a sense of direction. We don't have goals. And that contradicts nearly everything which has come out of systems thinking for the past four decades, which kind of like wants to have goals, objectives, vision statements, purpose, all these sort of phrases. Yeah. You can only have those if you've got material linear causality. Yeah. All of that implies that the future is definable. Um, in a complex adaptive system, you don't have linear material causality. Yeah, you have, don't even really have teleological um, causality either. What you've got is what's called dispositionality. So I can say the current dispositional state of the system is X. Yeah, and I can say these things are therefore unlikely to happen. And these things are more likely to happen. Um, but I can never say this will happen, or if we do this, we will get that result. Yeah. So that leads into this key principle of complexity, is we start journeys, we don't try and achieve goals. And if you start a journey with a sense of direction, you're open to novelty on the pathway. If you have very specific goals, you don't see the things which create that. And that's creating a whole new form of measurement. Um, I'm getting quite practical now. There's a thing called Goodhart's Law, which you might have come across, um, famous British economist. Goodhart's Law states that any statistical instrument used for policy loses all value. Yeah? That was rephrased by Marilyn Strathern, who is a really fierce British anthropologist. Do not cross Marilyn, you won't live. Yeah? Um, as the minute a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a measure. Because what you get is gaming behavior, which is what you get with goals. So the whole principle about starting journeys and seeking the adjacent possible, like stepping stones, and measuring that, and a vector measure is direction and speed of travel for intensity of effort. Okay. I'll repeat that. A vector measure is direction and speed for energy. It, it's, it's the balance between those three. We're now using that, for example, to measure um, the impact of nurses on patient health in COVID. Because actually, at the moment, the average British hospital has over a thousand outcome based targets with 15% of the, the money going on managing the measurement system rather than providing healthcare. Um, we can replace about 80% of those with patients keeping journals and nurses keeping journals, measuring the attractor wells, the dispositional states, and measuring whether you're moving things in the right direction. Yeah. So when, and 
that to my mind, I mean, the, the American equivalent of this is the educational system. Yeah, in which measurement is destroying any hope for people from deprived backgrounds. And I've, I've done a lot of field ethnography in the projects in New York. And it's the formalism and the, the measurement system of the education system, which is designed to improve things, which is actually holding people back. Yeah, it means teachers who actually inspire kids are generally punished. Teachers who are good at completing learning plans aren't. Yeah. Uh, another example on this, and I'm going to stop and open up for questions. Yeah, this is kind of like a general introduction. Uh, my daughter. Um, who is now 31, an anthropologist and working for me, which is quite scary because she also acts as shop steward for all my other research assistants. You know, I get this phone call with, Eddie's told us we're not to put up with this anymore and, and variations on the theme. Um, but she's a, she won the university prize for the best master's thesis. Um, she wrote it on 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 uh assemblage theory strange attractors in the anthropology of male diabetes um and she's going on to mental health in those other areas um either way so i lived with her through her b ba and then her ma yeah and i hope one of these days to live through a phd but she wants to study mental health and being as i was one of the subjects for a master's thesis her professors think she's waiting for me to become a subject for the the PhD, right? Now, at least that's the standard joke, right? Um, and it was fun because it's my subject, you know, the internet means I can chat with her while she's in lectures, I can feed her questions. We had a lot of fun disrupting things, yeah, in the way that fathers and daughters do. But the first essay she wrote for when she was an undergraduate actually picked up the theme for which she won the university prize five years later, but her essay failed. And I still remember, you know, picking her up, all right, she was in tears. And I said, look, Ellie, you wrote something original. You're not allowed to do that at undergraduate level. Yeah, the lecturer has got a marking plan. Yeah, and they're ticking you off against the marking plan and you have to work that out because that's the way you're gonna get good essay grades. And I said, that's actually a really bad thing which has happened to education. And I still remember the first essay I wrote, um, and this is British philosophy in the 1970s. And it got sent back and the professor had written on it, this is metaphysics, not philosophy, please rewrite it. So I sent it back with metaphysics is philosophy, please mark it. And we sort of carried on like that for three years, right? And I got quite a lot of A grades because I never, wrote to the marketing plan, I just had interesting ideas and I was a generalist, so I was pulling in things from other fields. And they quite liked that because it livened up what was otherwise a, a boring evening, but I would not survive that in a modern university. Yeah, so we're rewarding people who are game players and that means if I look at things like Black Lives Matter and the like, we're actually rewarding people who are educated to pass educational games. Yeah, rather than rewarding people who've got original thoughts and can actually develop in different ways. Yeah. So I'm coming back to where I started in the question. What complexity theory does is it basically says most of the way that systems thinking has worked for the past three decades only applies where the level of constraint is such that you've got a predictable relationship between cause and effect, i.e. the system is ordered. When you haven't got that level of constraint, none of those methods apply anymore and you have to develop different methods and tools and that's where I focus. So I'll come back to that definition I started with. How do I make sense of the world so that I can act in it? Right? Now with that comes the concept of sufficiency. So it's how do I know enough or how do I know when I know enough to act? And of course, the nature of the action could be anything from a definitive act to a series of parallel safe to fail experiments, yeah, to a mass engagement or, or what we call a sensor probe. Yeah? And I go through those when I go through Kinevin um, next week. Yeah? So that concept of what does it mean to act and what does it mean to know and when is that knowledge sufficient 
and the concept of being context specific, not context free. You know, all of those are coming out of this basic complexity science based approach to sense making. You know, I've spoken for 40 odd minutes there, so it's definitely time for wider oh, contribution. Yeah. And I oh, forgot, yeah. when did we stop, by the way, <laughs> Kyle? When do we stop? Oh, we start, uh, we're supposed to stop at three, right? But I guess okay, we're that's fine. Um, I'm, I'm relaxed. Okay, no, that was great. That's so much. I yes, haven't eaten, I haven't had a gin and tonic yet, and it's already, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that was amazing. Um, so much to chew on there. Wow. I forgot to say to everyone that, um, you know, you guys should put the questions in the chats, but you guys already knew that. And to keep it clean in the chats too. Um, but yeah, that was great. I, I really like your emphasis on the relationship between nodes rather than the attributes of the nodes themselves. Um, I think that's a really key, key point. Uh, but yeah, yeah I'm just gonna... it's, the key thing on, it's the key thing on organizational change. And I, I think it's also an ethical thing. Every, every attempt people make to change people, yeah, A, it's not going to work, and B, it's wrong. But changing how people connect is something which is ethically valid and will actually produce change faster. Yeah, I actually have a selfish question because I'm, I'm a, I guess, I'm like an urbanist, I guess, or I like urban studies. And uh, one of the things that they like to talk about is the impact of the built environment on relationships. I'm wondering if you come across any insights of yourself on that or um, if that brings, brings up anything for you. We're doing a fair amount of work on this in Singapore. Um, Singapore is interesting. I mean, when I left IBM, the head of the civil service, I, I've got a huge amount of respect for the civil service in Singapore. Uh, if you don't know, they have an elite educational system, which is entirely meritocratic. If you come from a poor family and you're bright, you're going to end up in that elite program. Yeah, the whole educational system is geared towards it. And the bright guys all become civil servants. They don't go into industry. And I remember that the head of the civil service, Peter Ho, is a brilliant guy, said two things to me. He said, one is, there's some very interesting ideas here, but you're not going to get it right up front. So I'll give you a series of projects because I want to be around when it works. And I can't think of any other civil servant in any other country in the world who would ever say that or take that risk, but it was encouraged, yeah. Um, the, the big thing that we've been, one of the latest, latest things we've been working on there is the built environment because Singapore know two or three things. First of all, they're within two or three decades of having to have the whole hop, having to have their whole population in air conditioning for several hours a day. Yeah, we, we, yeah, that, and Malaysia is going to suffer mass casualties and major immigration because the temperature is going to be consistently above fifty-five degrees Fahrenheit, at which point the body can't shed heat fast enough. Yeah, so they're preparing for that, unlike most cities around the world. And some of the stuff we're looking at there is actually increasing the size of the social space, but reducing the personal space. Yeah. Um, because if you look at the studies on aggressive behavior on rats, close confinement in public spaces, yeah, it can actually trigger the changes. So we need to make the public spaces more than the private spaces. Yeah. In, in that sort of sense. So that's been looked at. And they're thinking long term in that respect. I think there are lots of other things on that. I think, uh, I'll give you an example, one of the things they did in the UK in the 70s, we used to have to what called, used to have what were called two up, two downs. So two, two rooms on the ground floor, two rooms on the top floor in long terraced rows of houses, yeah? With the toilet in a sort of shed in the back, in colloquial English called the Kazi, yeah? Um, yeah, and if you had to walk down the garden in 1963 when it was bloody freezing cold, all right, you, you kind of like knew about that. Um, but those were real communities. And then in the white hot heat of the technological revolution, to quote Tony Ben, they basically demolished all of those and built tower blocks, which were designed to be perfect living environments for each other. And of course, they destroyed the community, they destroyed the dependencies, they destroyed the interaction and those are now mostly slums with high levels of violence, yeah? And you don't go down the lifts on your own late at night, yeah? So I think 
one of the things, and I, I, I remember going to Camberno, which is a brand new town in Scotland, which is now one of the major areas for crime. But the architects had designed it for the way they thought people should live, rather than building things on the way that people did live, right? So I think there's a whole body of work yeah, around that we need to think about, right? I mean, those would be some examples. Yeah, thank you, yeah. No, yeah, I did an exchange in Singapore and in the US, um, and it was really interesting to meet meet some of those people there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's so many questions. Sure. But Singapore is still a democracy, whereas the US hasn't been for a few years. But, yeah. Well, some would argue that it's a, you know, it's a pseudo democracy, but, but I, I get your point. No, actually, they're really, they're really trying to get opposition MPs elected at the moment. Mm. They're really worried that the Workers' Party don't have enough, but yeah. people are quite happy with the way Singapore is run, and you don't have to have, be a billionaire to get elected to their parliament. Yeah, that's called a rotten borough in, in democratic terms. Okay, so uh, are you able to stay like 10 or 15 minutes extra, uh, Dave? You want. Yeah, cool. Okay, oh, okay, perfect. Um, so yeah, we have a lot of questions um, trying to keep up, but we have Peter Jones with us here. Uh, Peter Jones, do you have a question? you have a question? Oh, thanks. Hi, Dave. Really enjoying uh, listening to you again. I've got a question relative to kind of the uh, conceit or the position of the STOA, that is, um, you know, know your work on multi-ontology sense-making. It's, it's an excellent framework that I think helps as a, as a reference for sorting out ontological and epistemological positions and ways of, of interacting and knowing um, how they might cross in communication. And so the, in the STOA, there's it's kind of launched with this position of the time of metacrisis with hardened positions in this crisis arising in mimetic tribes. And so, in these uh, mimetic tribes are, you know, the, the different trope tribes that we're shunted into. These can be seen as micro ontologies, right? They're ways that we're, we identify ourselves and hold not just to the tribe, but all the positions that go along with it. And they could blend, but we're kept in our swim lanes by this kind of new tribalism, social media, um, uh, propaganda, reinforcers. So we've got this world of strong norms and people are butting up against each other's positions all the time. My question would be then, given multi-ontology sense-making or how that might evolve, how do we break out of these, these strong normative lanes while holding our reputations, not getting canceled? How can we communicate um, within these expectation loops to help, to help uh, ourselves and to help others blend ontologies in a, you know, I mean, it takes some risk, right? How do we, how do we help, um, I don't know if it's a change in a way of thinking about your framework or using that in a way that we might communicate better to loosen the hold of these tribal mental models. I think there's some things we can bring in straight, straight away. One is we have a massive problem with the internet because the internet is an unbuffered feedback loop. If you have an unbuffered feedback loop, then perversion will come faster and it will be more or less unstoppable. If you remember what happened with automatic trading algorithms, which caused the stock exchange to crash, it's the same principle. So one of the programs which we're still trying to get funding for, but we've now done in Sweden, Colombia, Singapore, um, Egypt and elsewhere, is to use children as ethnographers through their schools into their communities on a continuous basis. So we put human interpretation and human validation of data rather than the classic black box. This is kind of like called rich data as opposed to thick data or, or big data. Yeah. So we increase the human buffering in the system, which also increases the empathy. The other thing we've also been doing there, which I'm quite proud of, is what we call transgenerational pairing. So that's linking young people with people in their grandparents' generation to come up with local initiatives. So trying to get away from grand initiatives to local initiatives locally generated. Now, again, that was science-based because we know that brain plasticity, yeah, kind of like, unless you're traumatized, it kind of like stops in your early 20s and doesn't start again until your 50s. So if you want innovation, you need to be under 25 or over 50. You don't get much between the two. 
Yeah? And the kind of like, re yeah, I know every, everybody's going to like this one of these days, right? But it's actually quite interesting. Innovation in the sciences is under 25. In the humanities, it's generally when you're older. Because, and the evolutionary argument, it's because it's synthesis, not flashes of genius. It's the ability to bring things together, which is what the humanities is about, right? So if you look at it in evolutionary terms, we have the longest period of training of any mammal. So there's very high levels of plasticity up until two. In fact, as far as we can see, some of your neocortex processing is actually done by your carers until two. Yeah, we, we don't quite know the mechanism for it yet, but it's actually why if you don't get the right level of nurture in those first two years, there are capacities which you never get a chance to develop again. It, it, it's an absolutely critical period. Um, as you start to hit puberty, the brain starts to lock down because you've got to go and hunt for the tribe. Yeah, and whatever the prejudices of the tribe, you'll adopt. You actually don't see racism in kids and before puberty. Yeah, but it comes in big time after puberty. Yeah. And then interestingly, chemically triggered male or female, you know, mid 40s, 50s, it becomes plastic again. And the argument is if you survive to that age in a hunter-gatherer tribe, you've got something about you which the tribe needs, but you better bloody well stop leading it because you're not fit enough anymore. So you go and sit around the campfire and look after the kids and teach them. Yeah? So we replicated that. Yeah, 15 transgenerational pairs, if they come up with a good idea, they're put into a trio with somebody from government who makes their ideas work. Yeah. So we're using technology as a connector, but we're increasing human buffering in the system. Right? So that's key. The other thing which I'll probably talk about next week is we brought heavily on board in the latest release of Kinevin, um, the concept of aporia. All right, and the aporetic. Right? Now remember the basic concept of aporia yeah, is that it's the unresolved, the, on, the only decision which is ever made is where you don't know what decision you can make. Everything else is a process. So the deliberate shift into an apparatic state, yeah, a conscious apparatic state, and then the ontological shift from that, and that's actually all written up in the EU handbook on crisis management. I'll, I'll go through that, yeah is you basically in a crisis what you do is you do radical sudden draconian imposition of constraints yeah the new zealand prime minister did this brilliantly she could have got it wrong but and that's okay but it was better to do it then because she couldn't wait the british and the, the americans waited when they imposed it it was kind of like too late to make a massive difference so you know you're going to get a lot of this wrong, but you, you basically make decisions fast to increase your option space downstream. Yeah. And that gives you the time to go into the apparatic state. And then you've got, you know, four different movements. One is those experts you were ignoring who you now know were right. Well, call them in, apologize, give them some cash. If you've got competition between experts, like in behavioral scientists against epidemiologists, which was a big issue, in the UK, then you ritualize the confrontation yeah, to resolve it. If you know the hypotheses about what you should do, you run parallel safe to fail experiments about the hypotheses. If you don't think you've covered off the hypotheses, then you do a mass sensing thing over a multi-sensor network from multiple perspectives in order to identify the hypotheses. Now, if you look what I've done there, I've got a simple stage plan which is all about awareness, all right? And what you're trying to do is to shift decision makers to be aware that there are systems where they can't have the right answer. Not only can't they have the right answer, but if they do think they've got the right answer, they're 90% certain to be wrong. And, and this is why a lot of us are pretty pissed off with Talib because Talib blocks anybody who doesn't worship at his feet. And I'm, I'm proud to have been blocked by Talib, all right? I mean, this is, I'm, I'm trying to get blocked by Trump as well. And I've got the complete card set of arrogant bastards, right? Um, and, you know, you've got people like Didier's work in, um, in Zurich, which is much better. But the concept of the fat tail is key. Um, because fundamentally, in the center of a normal distribution, you can use inductive logic. Yeah, which means you can create predictions. 
But in the tales of a Pareto distribution, you've got to take an abductive, not an inductive approach. Yeah? Now, abduction is, you know, this goes back to Quine, right? This is the, the logic of hunches. Now, the challenge I was given by Poindexter when I went to work for him in DARPA, and just to be clear, I'm a Welsh socialist. Um, I didn't know who he was until I decided I liked him, and then I discovered I wasn't meant to like him, but I'm afraid I've, I've got a lot of respect for John. Yeah? John Poindexter, oh, okay. Yeah, oh. Admiral John Poindexter. I, I worked for him for eight years of my life. He was brilliant. Total information awareness. Yeah. yeah, well, he had two programs. He had TIA, which he got into trouble with the Congress with, and he had Genoa too, which I ran with Mayor Lepar, which was the human side. People forget about that one. He had two bets. Yeah. And I remember him saying when he was NSA, um, every time he asked for advice, all the, aid, all the agencies competed to have their advice accepted, not to tell him what he needed to know. And I've validated that with two other NSAs since, one Democrat and one Republican. So he said, your job is to find a way in which I can go directly from an abstract representation to the raw data without interpretation. Okay? And that's called disintermediation. Now that's key to changing people. Yeah, the big thing we're working on at the moment is to entangle a politician with the lives of people who vote for them so they can see empathetic resonance. That's our next big project. Yeah. And without, in, without being buffered by interpretive layers. So there's a lot of things we can do. We just need to do them at scale. Thank you for that. Um, okay, so we have a lot of plus ones on. I'll just call on Jan. Do you have a question you'd like to ask? You could unmute yourself and ask, or would you like okay. me to um, ask? Oh. I, let me find my question. Um, it would be useful, by the way, to have a copy of the chats because I can look at those before next week. Yeah, that sort of forming what, what I mean today was designed to be quite open and chat and then the next three a bit more structured so I'm sort of working out what I put into those yeah cool I'll get them okay. for you I uh, found my question um what, what are some systems or institutions that by conventional thinking are considered broken or failed but under a complexity framework you see they they do things well um I'm not sure I fully heard it, but let me answer what I think I've heard and then you can tell me how wrong I was, all right? I, I think there's some interesting examples here. Jury trial is broken, um, but there are actually better ways of doing that. Um, one of the things we're, we're trying to work on an experiment with at the moment is to have four juries of three people in separate rooms. And if three of the four agree, the person is guilty or innocent. Yeah, so you, st you stop the phenomenon of 12 people in a room being dominated by one personality. So that's taking a complexity perspective, right? Um, I think the other thing which is completely shot at the moment is democracy. Um, democracy in the form most of us know it evolved in, in England in the 19th century, you know, with the Great Reform Acts. And it was based on a small population where people could know who they were voting for. Yeah, so there was, a, and people regularly crossed the floor. So people changed party allegiance. There was a lot of flux. Yeah. By the 1950s and 60s, yeah, the population was so big that people voted for a slate. They didn't vote for a person because they couldn't know them. And people always, you know, in order to be in parliament, you had to be in a political party and you kind of like chose the one at university based on who was going to be there. Um, so you've got that sort of problem. Yeah, and I go back to the American Constitution. If you go back to the founding fathers, they said nobody should be elected to the post of president by the popular vote, because we'll get despots and populists. Yeah, and the whole electoral college, which you find some people you trust and they go away and pick somebody to be president because we've given them a lot of powers. Yeah, so I think there's some, and there, there are issues there on the, you know, the number of acquaintances you can maintain is about 150. Um, once a population goes above about 5 million, it loses cultural cohesion and it gets fractious. So there's a whole body of stuff we know there in terms of looking at, for example, delegative democracy rather than one person, one vote. Yeah. 
Um, and the perversion is high. I mean, I think America is the only country in the world where you can advertise your services to stop people voting and you don't get in prison for, put in prison for it. Yeah, so, you know, the, 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 the democracy is shot at the moment, right? And, you know, we're, we're working with Extinction Rebellion, which is really interesting um, because they're going through the same sort of factional fights that the left went through in the 70s, yeah? Yeah, the Monty Python, Life of Brian, People's Front of Judea is regrettably still present in the ecological movement, right? So we're, we're trying to change that, right? But one of the things we're doing with them and some others is we're looking at how can we involve the whole of the population in the citizen jury, and we've already done that in Wales, or in the citizen assembly. Um, but the trouble is at the moment, everybody's jumping into new ways of making decisions without having the raw science. They're just doing what they think works or copying what somebody else did. And that ain't going to work because it won't scale. I mean, one of the classic mistakes people make in the Middle East is we confuse, we confuse gifts with bribes. The Middle East is based around a gifting culture, but from a Western perspective, it looks like a bribe. And so we end up making the thing corrupt because we don't understand the way it works. In the West, we have an equivalent. If you belong to the right golf club, you're going to get contracts. Yeah, the way DARPA money is allocated, I've, been, I've, got, I've had DARPA contracts. It's very simple. You get invited to a hotel for two days. You pay for your own time. You talk about the solution. If they like what you say, they write the RFP to exactly match what you said. So you get the contract. That's how DARPA works. Yeah? because you need the human judgment element within the system. So this question about a new, it, it, this is why my sense making is called naturalizing sense making. It's like naturalizing epistemology. It's to base sense making in the natural sciences, not the social sciences. Okay. Um, so yeah, we're just going to do one more question. I'm sorry, everyone else. Um, but I'm, I'm going to call on Rain. Uh, yeah, Rain, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, um, thanks, Dave. This is really amazing. Um, I had a question. I'll try to make it relevant for everybody. It's really about distributed cognition, but some of the things you were mentioning remind me of Edwin Hutchins' work, and I honestly haven't uh, read any... Um, cognitive ethnography since reading Hutchins. So I'm just curious uh, how that influences your work and where's the overlap with either cognitive ethnography or distributed cognition? Cognition in the wild is in that bookshelf behind me. Those are the books I keep going back to and reading, all right? Um, yeah, I mean, I think the, the way we do it with human systems is that, and that there are several things, human beings are brilliant at gaming. Right? So the thing a human being will do if you ask them a question is they'll work out what answer you want. And they'll either give you that answer or they'll give you the opposite. That's kind of like the basic response. Yeah. So one of the things we developed, and this was when we were dealing with the problem from, that John sent me, which is how do you objectify abduction? So how is one person's intuitive leap more accurate than somebody else's intuitive leap? Yeah. And the way we did that was to create what's called high abstraction signification, which is you interpret data, but you can't know what the right answer is. And the method of interpretation creates a cognitive load. So you flip from what's called autonomic processing to what's called novelty receptive processing in real science. Or if you read economists who didn't bother to walk across to the corridor and ask their neuroscience colleagues earlier, thinking fast and thinking slow. Yeah, we, we knew everything that he found in that book before he found it. Yeah, but people just don't work across disciplines because that way you go deeper, all right? So that's the cognitive load aspect. So if I get 5,000 people to interpret the same data in the same time slot in a way in which they don't know what the right answer is, I can draw fitness landscapes from that, which show the general pattern of belief and show the outlier beliefs and others. And interestingly, we, we originally developed this in the concept of conflict resolution in um, Colombia. 
And I'm now using exactly the same techniques on conflict resolution in maternity services in Scotland, which to be quite honest is a lot, ham lot harder and more dangerous than handling the FARC, right? Um, because you've got this tension between surgeons who want all women at six months put into a hospital so there's no risk of anything going wrong, where they've got all their super equipment, yeah, and women and their families who quite like, quite like to be in a local hospital. And remember, this is islands off Scotland where you're two days from a hospital and stuff like that. The way we're handling that is all the groups are presenting their summary. Then every other group will interpret everybody else's summaries and then we'll produce overlaid contour maps, which so where they're agreed, where the disagreement is so extreme they can't talk about it, and where there are outlier clusters of agreement by which we can make a change. That's distributed cognition. Yeah, um, it's and and it, you've got it. I've argued for a very long time, and this is where I would depart slightly from Hutchins. Is human beings aren't ants? This is what I keep saying down at Santa Fe, and they get all upset about this because human beings have to be ants for their models to work. Yeah, um, human beings have intelligence. We have multiple identities. We have intentionality. Um, human decision making is a level of complexity well above anything that you see in the wild. We're the only species to show empathy outside a kinship group, for example, and that's significant. Yeah. Um, I think I mentioned this last time, but Terry's brilliant book on radical sacrifice is worth reading. Uh, human beings understand the necessity and role of sacrifice. Yeah? And that, that's what we can build on. So you've got to build distributed cognition systems which recognize those unique aspects of humans. Excellent, excellent. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Dave. I'm going to pass it over to Peter uh, to just close out this session, but I just want to say thanks again and thanks for the questions. And Dave will be back again. So um, if you have any burning questions, I know some people had some burning questions. Mamedic Caper, uh, Rosa, Albert, bring them next time and hopefully we can get to them. Cool. Thank you, uh, Cleo, for emceeing. Um, Dave, uh, just you want to set up next week or any uh, final thoughts before I make some announcements? I, uh, my plan next week is to do the basic Canavian framework, the concept of the apparatic and liminal and constraints. Yeah. So I'll have some slides next week. Sorry, but I, I can't draw in this virtual environment. It, yeah. Very cool. All right. So I'll make some closing announcements in a moment. But uh, Dave, thank you so much for coming to the STOA for the Sense Maker in Residence series, uh, the first one for September. Um, for her upcoming events at the STOA, you can go to the STOA.ca. I just posted in the chat. We have a Discord. So if you want to uh, continue this conversation right now, you can just go to the Discord, go to the, the rule section, give it a thumbs up, and then all the other channels opened up and there's video chats and stuff like that. Sign up for the mailing list. And if you'd like to support the STOA, you can go to our Patreon page uh, to continue having uh, amazing events like this. Uh, tomorrow we have a uh, uh, student of the human condition, uh, Peter Wang. Uh, he's, he's doing a series on mental models. He's another sense maker in residence in September. That's uh, tomorrow at 10 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, and we have uh, Joe Norman uh, doing a session on com applied complexity um, in the September uh, 10th at 10 p.m. Eastern time. We might even have uh, Nassim Taleb join the STOA. So maybe there's some crossover here with uh, Snowden and, uh, and uh, the man himself. So we'll see about that. Uh, that being said, thank you, David and everyone for coming to the STOA today. Thank you.